Okay, hello, everybody. My name is Rafael Fernandez de Castro. I'm the director of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies at the University of California, San Diego. And on behalf of the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy, both centers are part of the School of Global Policy and Strategy, GPS. We welcome you to this uh, second day of the conference, the US MCA and Global Supply Chains. We believe this is a very important topic. This is at the center of US Mexican, of North American integration. So we welcome everybody. And we're featuring today Robert Selig. Uh, and thank you both for being with us. It's, uh, uh, you're a champion of, of North America. So thank you uh, again for being with us. Uh, I will ask Caroline Frund, our dean, to introduce him properly. But let me first of all thank uh, all our team to put this together. I would say that this is uh, teamwork at its best. It's two centers, the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy, the Center for US Mexican Studies. And I want to thank our staff, uh, the staff of, of GPS, and also, I, I would like to mention, of course, uh, Renee Bowen. She's the director of the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy. I also want to thank Lawrence Bross, the co-director of the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy, and Kyle Handley, who is a faculty member of UPS, and he's been very helpful to us in putting this together. Thank you all uh, for your help. And let me uh, uh, introduce uh, my boss, Caroline Frunt. Uh, Caroline just arrived to GPS uh, three months ago, July 1st. And I will say that uh, just over a hundred days that she's in her job, now she's already at full swing. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Caroline served as Global Director of Trade Investment and Competitiveness at the World Bank. She served also before that as Senior Fellow at the Patterson Institute of International Economics. She's the author of, an, of, of, of various books, and uh, but the one that I would like to uh, put, uh, share with you is uh, Rich People, Poor Countries, The Rise of Emerging Markets, Tycoons, and Their Mega Firms. Caroline Frun was co-director of the World Bank's flagship program on global value chains. So she's very... Uh, uh, She's an expert on this topic, and, and I'm glad that she's participated on this. Caroline, thank you for your support. Thank you for your openness, and thank you for your leadership. Yours is the floor. Please uh, go ahead, Caroline. Thank you, thank you so much, Rafael. Um, and it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Bob Zellick. He was the 11th president of the World Bank from 2007 to 2012, and I had the pleasure of working with him while he was there. Uh, he was also previously United States Deputy Secretary of State and uh, United States Trade Representative. Um, he's been a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center of Science and International Affairs since ending his term with the World Bank. And he also works with the Brunswick Group. I wanted to say a word. Uh, we're going to talk about North America today, but I want to say a word about how uh, Bob Zellick is remembered at the World Bank because he still is among all the uh, old, old timers there as the only president we ever had that read everything that went up to him, wrote notes, sent it back to staff. So very highly regarded uh, as, as probably uh, what the most or one of the most uh, smartest uh, presidents of, of the bank we had. He also democratized development. And what does that mean? And I think it's something that we as a school of global policy and strategy uh, really both benefit from, and it's also our aim as well. He opened up World Bank data and publications beyond any paywall. And this just had huge implications for the developing world uh, because it means that you have access to that data, that information, um, and data is power. It allows the innovation, it allows the th critical thinking, and it allows uh, much, more, you know, a greater use of evidence-based policy. And I think that was a huge, huge step that the World Bank took. But today we're here to talk about North America. And of course, uh, 
Bob Zellick has also been a big proponent of integration in North America. So I'm gonna to turn to you now uh, for your remarks. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Caroline, for such a generous uh, introduction. Um, and I wanna compliment uh, UC San Diego and my friend Raphael and uh, Renee Bowen. And of course you as a former colleague and now congratulations as Dean uh, for, for organizing this conference. My one regret is, as I look at your beautiful backdrops, I wonder what I'm doing in Virginia while all of you are in San Diego, but such as it is. I, I was very appreciative to see your agenda because I think you're focusing on very important practical challenges, uh, identifying the steps to strengthen North American linkages, but importantly, in doing so, understanding North America's potential in a global context. So today I'd like to step back a bit and share some thoughts on the North American idea that was behind the NAFTA project. So in 1989 and 90, the Bush 41 administration was pretty busy. We were focusing on the end of the Cold War in Europe, German unification, seeking to create a Europe whole and free. That was of course followed by Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and, and the, the Gulf War. We helped launch APEC in 1989 across the Asia Pacific and dealt with China after Tiananmen Square. Yet even amidst all this activity, we recognize that a new idea of North America had to be an important part of a post-Cold War world. In a book that I uh, released about a year ago, looking at American diplomatic and history and foreign policy, I found a speech that Ronald Reagan gave in 1979, opening his presidential campaign. And it's almost amazing given some of the rhetoric over the past years. In his speech announcing his presidential campaign, he said, the US and Mexico, the US would be better off with Mexico and Canada stronger than they are today. And it's time that we stop thinking of our nearest neighbors as foreigners. So that was the underlying logic. Now, Secretary Baker and I, uh, in, in the very end of the Reagan administration, had to intervene to complete the negotiation of the US-Canada Free Trade Agreement. That was in 1988, when we were at the Treasury Department. Now, some of you may know, there were a number of earlier efforts to deepen US and Canadian economic integration, but they'd failed, given the historical and political sensitivity. Indeed, there'd actually been a reciprocal trade agreement negotiated in 1911, but it fell with the change of government and election in Canada in that year. So Prime Minister Moroni had courageously tried again, but part of his logic was not only relations with the US, but it was to strengthen Canada's global governance. And he waged his 1988 re-election on the whole logic of NAFTA, very important step. But the Bush administration understood that the next step would have to come from Mexico because of the history the loss of about a third of Mexico's territory in the Mexican-American War, and all the other conflicts that were summarized by the old adage, poor Mexico, so close to the US, so far from God. Now, Secretary Baker was familiar with Mexico's economic challenges from the debt crisis of the 1980s. But we were also recognizing there was even a bigger shift taking place. The old Mexican corporate estate led by the PRI since the 1920s, was fractured. And as students of Mexico know, that old model, all the parts of, of Mexican society, politically, industry, unions, the state governments, media, university, military, the courts, everything fit within this hierarchical structure of a corporatist government with the PRI president at the apex. And of course, that president had only one term to limit the personal power. So we were wondering, as that system was starting to break down, where would the pieces of Mexican society reattach and with what now models? So the idea behind NAFTA was much more than a trade agreement. We were seeking to try to connect Mexican institutions and society to US and Canadian networks that meant the private as well as the public sector. Now it's worth noting that this model of integration differed from that of the European Union, which was based on the logic of shared sovereignty, 
All three North American countries have a very strong sense of independence and sovereignty, so a shared sovereignty model would not work. NAFTA encouraged mutuality, frameworks for deeper cooperation, and attention to shared interests. It was also supposed to try to help Mexico import the rule of law in its economic system, for example, in investment. But we also hoped that the linkages would encourage ties with many other institutions, universities, media, environmental and conservation groups, as we've seen eventually railroads, and of course, a wider business community. Now, over 25 years, that idea took many practical forms, but it was incomplete. Many Mexican economic institutions became world-class. In my later experience working with the the Central Bank, the Ministry of Finance, some of Mexico's regulators, many of the businesses, these became world-class competitors. And importantly, Mexico recast its international orientation, not just looking to North America, but looking globally as a member of APEC, the OECD, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and then the Pacific Alliance of four Latin American economies. Mexican officials rose to positions of global leadership, for example, heading the BIS and the OECD. And former President Calderon put international climate negotiations back on track after the collapse in Copenhagen through his leadership at the Cancun Conference of Parties, which our friend Rafael assisted. So when I became US trade representative in 2001, it was striking to me that my closest partners internationally were my Canadian and my Mexican colleagues. When I was at the World Bank, as Caroline mentioned, I kept an eye out for the professional development of Mexican and, and Canadian colleagues, trying to make sure as different nations jostled for positions that Mexicans and Canadians also got a fair shot. And interestingly, Mexico provided a model for others. For example, the Oportunidades program, which was developed in, in concert with the Inter-American Development Bank, launched what was known as an idea of conditional cash transfers. So the basic idea was a small sum of cash given to a woman head of households uh, for the bottom 10, 15, 20% of the economy if two conditions were met. Children went to schools and women had health checkups, probably did more for women's health in Mexico than anything in the history of the country. But what was striking about that model was how it could be applied in other areas. And when I left the bank almost a decade ago, we had experimented with it in 45 other countries. And the wonderful part was, it wasn't just a textbook example of progress, because if countries wanted to understand how it would work, we could connect them to the Mexican colleagues. The Bolsa Familia program, which became quite important uh, in, uh, during Brazil's difficulties, including during COVID, was basically based on the Opportunatus program. Now, the US, Canadian, and Mexican foreign policy positions usually, but not always, showed closer alignment. And this was striking to me because during the 1980s, if I had misplaced my briefing book and didn't know what the Mexican position was on a particular foreign policy issue, I could probably take the US position and put a negative sign in front of it. And with all humor involved, in a sense, the foreign ministry during the 70s and early 80s was where the PRI put anti-American intellectuals to safely remove them from domestic politics. But this was totally changed in the start of the 21st century. I remember discussing with Chancellor Merkel of Germany when I was at the World Bank, some issue that involved both developed and developing countries. And I mentioned how I thought Mexico would be supportive. And she said to me, well, of course, Mexico will support the US. And I was struck that 20 years ago, somebody wouldn't have made that observation. But the transformation was far from complete. For example, in education and in energy, although President Calderon and, and President Pino Nito made efforts at reforms, the work still had to be done. Interestingly, we saw a phenomenon that I've seen in other large countries that had enhanced the democratic process. And that is the decentralization of politics gave more authority to the state governments but the capacity in the state governments didn't match that that was at the federal level. And most dangerous, organized criminal networks, finance by narcotics and human trafficking, 
challenge law enforcement, police, prosecutors, courts, and of course, the ongoing troubling issue of, of corruption. David Petraeus, uh, the former general, but also CIA director who worked with Mexico on some of these security issues, shared with me an interesting story he had with former President Calderon as the President Calderon was about ready to step down at the end of his term. And the president was understandably proud of the effort he'd made to build a federal police force of, if I recall, about 50,000 uh, people. And Petraeus replied, so you should be proud, Mr. President. But based on the experience that he had had in counterinsurgency, you only have about 300,000 more to go. So at heart, what he was saying is this problem of organized crime and criminal networks has some similarities to the challenges of insurgency that one has to deal with in a very large scale fashion. And that's a very sobering recognition. Now, the past years have been a difficult time for the North American idea. We had Trump's rampage. Uh, Mexicans can speak better than I can to uh, President Lopez Obrador's sort of weakening of institutions. But if you step back, consider this very important point. Trump wanted to kill NAFTA. He wanted to kill NAFTA very badly. But after 25 years, he couldn't. The idea and practice was too embedded in the three countries to do so. And again, from a Mexican perspective, uh, President Lopez Obrador earlier in his career had certainly been no fan of NAFTA, but he also had accepted it. So now we have the USMCA. Some of the aspects trouble me, for example, the weakening of the investment protections and some of the protectionist rules of origin, but there are opportunities too. The labor standards might strengthen free trade unions in Mexico, so to complement some of the social institution development, just as the economic institutions have been developed. But the critical question, and one that this conference is looking at, is how does one do this in a way that strengthens free labor unions without sliding into protectionism? There's perhaps an opportunity to calm the sniping against NAFTA by U.S. protectionists. And another topic you're examining, the pandemic and partial decoupling from Mexico should opportunities offer opportunities for deeper North American sourcing and supply chains. I believe we also will need over time to extend the economic opportunity to Central America. We started to do that in another trade agreement with which I was involved, the CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, where some of the specialists will recall, we experimented with accumulation provisions with, for apparel across Central America, as well as Mexico. Now to seize these ideas, these opportunities, we need persistent, practical steps, border security and efficiency, customs policies, use of information technology and AI, the right infrastructure, conservation and environment, water, cyber, biological security. But as we do so, what I'd urge is that we try to keep a strategic vision in mind, a North Star, if you will, to point us in the right direction. And for me, that vision is of three democracies of almost 500 million people with an integrated infrastructure to foster interconnected and competitive agriculture, resource development, manufacturing, services, and technology, a shared skilled labor force that prospers with investment in human capital because North America has better demographics than the rest of the world if we see our people as a resource as opposed to a problem. Energy self-sufficiency and even the ability to export, a common natural bounty of air, water, land, biodiversity, wildlife, and migratory species, closer security cooperation on threats of all kinds, closer cooperation on economic, political, and environmental topics, certainly in the Western Hemisphere, and I hope globally. For the US, but also for Canada and Mexico, we should recognize North America as a continental base, which will enhance our leverage and our influence globally. NAFTA and the US-Canada Free Trade Agreement did this for the Canadian economy. As I've mentioned, Mexico over the past 30 years expanded its role in APEC, TPP, OECD. So while we can see this as a regional continental base, we need to always look at it in global terms. So I wanna thank Rafael 
um, and uh, uh, University of California, San Diego for shining a light on the North American idea, but also focusing a laser beam on the key components that will make it into practice. And I very much hope that this will be an ongoing effort. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for these, the, the enlightening speech. And I just wanted to also mention that I'm, I'm joined here today with um, Gurkiti Aluwalia, who is a first year master's student and will participate in asking some of the questions. Um, and I wanted to start by responding to one of the comments you made about NAFTA and the commercial links being too deep so that Trump really did wanna kill it, but he couldn't because the commercial links were too deep. And I think one could say the same thing about global supply chains today. On the other hand, in light of COVID induced supply chain disruptions, as well as the US China trade tensions, there's a lot of discussion about reshaping supply chains and specifically making them more regional and potentially using trade or industrial policy as a tool. So do you think this is feasible or do you think those links are also too deep? And what policies would be needed to get it right without slowing growth? Well, Caroline, as you know, um, with trade topics like this, there's there's often a, a backstory. And, and as your research has shown, uh, as early as about 2008, you started, the trade system is dynamic and it's always evolving. And so you started to see a slowdown in some of the manufacturing goods trade increases. So it gone from about two to three times GDP growth to about the same as GDP growth. What was interesting, however, was you saw a surge on the services trade. Um, and this is, I think, only going to be accelerated by uh, COVID and the, the use of data systems. So the whole issue of data and information technology, I think, will be an increasingly important piece. But even before COVID, you were starting to see a shift in the nature of supply chains. So it was starting to become less of a low-cost labor arbitrage. It was starting to rely more on knowledge worker uh, uh, arrangements. Um, we, the evidence is still out on the effect of 3D manufacturing, but 3D manufacturing in some sectors creates the opportunity for moving from uh, sort of large numbers of components assembled over great distances to a customized production of small batches on site. Now, there was some research, I think, by the Peterson Institute, you were probably involved with it, looking at uh, hearing aids and sort of whether that, that the supposition didn't turn out to be the case, but it was a sort of a, it was sort of a, a different type of product. So my point with this is that um, you are already seeing the importance of knowledge worker data, different types of logistics and supply chain issues. Now, you again have probably looked closely at the fact that, that when you when you see the surveys of companies and their CFOs or purchasing agents. They clearly reflect a move from just in time calculations to more of a, a, a safety, uh, a, a just in case, as opposed to just in time. From what I've seen, that you would be closer, the data is still out on whether that actually has showed up in terms of, of kind of the practices. Anecdotally, uh, from the various companies that I've evolved with, one does see that there's a desire to diversify location of production facilities. I think some of this is driven more by the perception of over-reliance on China than it is on, on other issues. And so make a footnote here, this does provide some, perhaps, some opportunities perhaps for Mexico in the North American context. The other issue that I would flag, and it's I'm glad it's why you're, this conference is digging into some of the details of this, is, you do see an increasing fragmentation within the system. So while we talked about the information and data rules, one of the things that's striking is traditionally the US, because it's a cutting edge economy, would lead in trying to set the standards and norms of those rules. It, it really hasn't been doing so in the past five or six years. There's some provisions, as you know, in USMCA, there's some other provisions 
<coughs> but the U.S. trade policy, frankly, became more mercantilist sales arrangements for China and others. And so <coughs> companies are struggling to figure out how do they adapt to it? Can they come up with the standards? We saw Japan and Australia step forward to save the TPP arrangement, of which Mexico and Canada are part, but not the U.S. The part that I'm most concerned about is represented by an anecdote. So I won't give you the specific country but I'll say it's a country that it's a traditional free trading country. I had dinner recently with the Minister of Trade and Industry. And 10 or 20 years ago, when I had met this person's predecessors, we would have been talking about negotiations in the WTO or regional or other issues. This person's attention is now very much focused on the industry aspect of the portfolio. In other words, it's the national development strategy. Now, of course, some of this occurs, but the danger here is that you're going to have increased subsidies, increased protectionism, uh, and uh, this, of course, adds costs that aren't immediately obvious to consumers, but add up over time. And where, if I could bring this together, one of the parts that I often find a contradiction these days is I'm often asked, well, you know, is globalization in retreat? Well, if you look at the debate over COVID and biological security or the environment or international economic and finance conditions, it's a little hard to say that globalization is in retreat. However, the governance of globalization is in retreat. And I think that again, brings us right back to what with the possibility of the North American arrangement building on the legal structure, but in a very practical way to try to set models and examples that perhaps can expand others. Excellent. Thank you so much. And since you mentioned the 3D hearing aid work, I just thought I would uh, say a little bit about it because I was involved in that work actually along with two colleagues from the World Bank, uh, Michael Ru Nikhil Ruta and Alan Malabdich. And this idea of new technologies affecting trade was of concern because if you build all this infrastructure, but then everything moves home, because of things like 3D printing, there'll be a lot less trade. And so we looked for a product that was 3D printed and hearing aids is, is among the few that's almost entirely and looked what happened to trade and it actually increased because the productivity effects of 3D printing far dominated the localization effect. So you really need to have a model uh, uh, where, um, where uh, there there weren't there weren't there wasn't still some comparative advantage that that was was prominent, but there there turned out there was. So it was it was interesting to to see that. But I wanted to follow up on this this point about subsidies because on the one hand that's certainly clogging the trade system. On the other hand, in light of COVID, everyone's increasing. Um, uh, I mean, all countries have been supporting firms and rightly so during this period uh, when, especially some months ago when, when growth was slow. Uh, so, so how do we tackle that? And maybe tying in the revamping of NAFTA and some of these other trade deals, there was an idea around using TPP to revamp NAFTA and reset the rules. Is there still, what's the best strategy to get to um, a better trade governance now that would uh, be able to address issues like subsidies? Well, um, as, as, you, as you probably know, uh, there are different ways of approaching the issue of availability of materials. So, you, you may recall, um, and I think you were also involved with this, in 2008 and 2009, when we had the financial crisis, we also had a food price crisis. And one of the initiatives that we pressed actually with the French presidency of the G20 was to have an enhanced transparency about stocks and supplies um, and uh, to try to work with countries one by one on export constraints. Um, because the export constraints on the food exacerbated the price and volatility and insecurity problems that you get. I was struck when your 
former colleague Chad Bowen did a piece again on supply chains at the Peterson Institute. And he went back and looked at this transparency initiative and found that it seemed to have a beneficial effect in the food price area uh, sort of over the course of the next decade, which was a, a nice feeling. Um, but he and I would also then sort of apply this as we think about uh, healthcare supplies. When one, when one looks at all the components of what goes into the healthcare supply chain, and I, I forget whether for vaccines, I saw some reference there's about 230 components that go into the nature of the vaccine. And frankly, it's, it's, it's true for uh, semiconductors as well. It's very unlikely that any one country is going to have all of those components. So the starting point is to have, and, and would be very expensive to do so. Maybe the US could do so, but the starting point would be to try to have a better sense of transparency about the different components, their relationship, and trying to have some resilience or robustness in terms of the availability of those without necessarily having to do them all in one economy. So that's, that's where I would sort of suggest to start. You know, I may be one of the last fiscal conservatives left too, but so I'm also a little worried when I look at the, you know, it doesn't surprise me that semiconductor executives would like to have subsidies for big capital intensive plants. Um, I can understand the benefits of having some of those facilities, um, if not in the US, in partner countries, so not having it all in Taiwan. So this is not an either or issue. But does it all have to be in the US or could there be a combination of Japan, South Korea, US, EU, you know, partners that you can have a pretty high degree of reliability on? Now, having said this, it does put a burden on the key player, the US, <laughs> to act in a non-mercantilist fashion. And there's no doubt that some of the policies the United States that had in the Trump administration sort of undermine that. So I think this is gonna be a slow rebuilding process and with, with partners trying to create uh, practical examples. Now, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm disturbed that as we discuss these issues, you know, the WTO sort of falls off the, the, the radar screen. And, you know, it, it, it's striking to me that, you know, from discussions that I've had with people in Geneva that, you know, the United States, you know, not only has not moved on the appointment of appellate judges to restart the dispute settlement system. But frankly, we haven't told people what we want. I mean, it's a little hard to negotiate if you don't have a sense of what we want. And I'm worried that, again, this is something that doesn't perhaps sort of penetrate to the higher political level, but we're, we're basically accepting the Trump idea that we will destroy the dispute settlement system and we'll just rely on our economic power. For those of you that are close to the USMCA negotiations, this was Bob Lighthizer's view. He wanted to dismantle the dispute settlement system. And the irony is, is that uh, the Democratic sides, including Catherine Tai, wanted to keep it in place in part for the labor standards. <laughs> they were less interested in the, in, the, uh, in the trade part. So these are questions we have to ask ourselves. Will it really serve American and global and North American systemic interests to dismantle these supply chain systems? I will point out that the W, most people are probably unaware of this, the WTO just upheld a, an American safeguard about um, um, solar uh, panels uh, versus uh, China. And again, that will simply increase the costs for our solar panels, but nevertheless, it did accept that the safeguard system, which I think has to be a political component, could be part of this sort of ongoing negotiation. So to come back, uh, to your point, Caroline, I think you know, the, the starting point is if the U.S. isn't at the table, it's a little hard to shape the system. So whether it's TPP, whether it's a digital accord, whether it's the follow-up with USMCA, you know, we have to, for political reasons, I understand the administration doesn't want to complicate its congressional relations as it's trying to put this package together, but I hope it gets off the dime after this. And I think, again, if I would draw an analogy, you know, the Obama administration basically ignored TPP for four years in the first term. And then uh, in part, because one of the foreign policy officials showed the trade data to President Obama, President Obama decided he wanted to push again. He saw the U.S. was falling behind. And Michael Froman came in as USTR and he pushed. Now, frankly, you know, the, the, the Trade Promotion Authority 
was passed by uh, Paul Ryan as speaker in 2015. And if you'd had TPP done a year earlier, at least he believes he would have passed TPP. But for four years, we didn't act. So we kind of, we missed it by about six or nine months. And so my point about this is, is that I, I think uh, the U.S. is going to have to figure out whether it's willing to uh, sort of slip into mercantilism or wants to be part of a rules-based international order. One last point on this related to China that I think many Americans ignore too, and that is you can get some help from Europeans and others on some of the Chinese issues, but you won't get it if your trade strategy is basically a mercantilist sales package for the US. Why should they help us with sales be displaced from others? So this is where I realize concepts like rules-based order sound a little fudgy, but they are very important in terms of whether you wanna keep this system going. To bring this back to this exercise, we now have USMCA in place. And so the work that you're discussing over these two days is critically important because now you have to make it work in fact. And that will often involve issues that don't require formal trade negotiations. They require infrastructure, customs information, technology, and other issues. Thanks very much. And I'd like to highlight two points you made. One about transparency that I think that is really the first step to addressing subsidies is to understand where they are because they can be done in so many different ways. Um, so like anything we do, we need to be able to measure it in order to fix it. And so transparency in subsidies and in the trade system more broadly uh, it is really critical. And the other is US leadership uh, where, you know, in, in, in the previous century, at the beginning, it was the UK really guiding uh, multilateralism. And then eventually as US became the bigger, biggest trader, it switched to the US um, who put together the dispute settlement process, et cetera. WTO was a big, big factor behind it. And, and now we're a bit stalled on that front. And we really need to think, is the US gonna take that over? Um, what's gonna happen? And, and to maintain a rule-based system. But I wanna to turn to Gwerki Kriti and see if she has a question or wants to read some of the questions that are starting to come in. Thank you, Caroline. Um, thank you, Mr. Zellick for such a great talk so far. We do have a question in the chat from Mark Holmland. Um, how does the U.S. help Mexico overcome the corruption in its government and law enforcement and also help them defeat the drug cartels? Um, are these problems intractable? Yeah, that is really uh, what we used to call the million dollar question. Now, I suppose we have to say billion dollar question, given the expansion. Um, at the end of the day, this has to be a decision by the Mexican people and the Mexican government. I've watched this in other parts of the world. It, it just doesn't work unless the local people own it. Um, my own sense uh, from a distance is the Mexican people are greatly frustrated at this. And partly they, they've, they've expressed this at the voting box and, and uh, through demonstrations and other issues. Then the question is whether the US, Canada and others can offer support and support can take different forms. Uh, there's intelligence support. So if I use the example of counterinsurgency, uh, there's a lot that can be shared about uh, such groups and criminal operations that the US has unparalleled capabilities. There's models from other countries. So remember I used the Operatonatus model about to show what was done in Mexico and many other countries. One of the wonderful things about the field of development over the past 30 or 40 years was that, you know, perhaps in the 70s or early 80s, the examples had to come from other developed countries to developing countries. And that was a hard transfer. You've now seen a lot of examples across other developing countries of different transparency corruptions, anti-corruption bodies. Again, you know, when I was at the World Bank, we, we tried to take steps against corruption through our own programs. But uh, we also created something called the Corruption Hunters Alliance. And it was really just a support network of prosecutors and courts and judges, because these are courageous people facing tremendously difficult problems. And it helped for them to know that others 
you know, tried to back them and, and give different types of resources. Uh, this will, of course, involve the Mexican police system. And I made a reference to the efforts that I thought President Calderon made of the right type of efforts. Um, and, uh, and of course, it will also go to the, the court and, and overall legal system. Part of this will be resources um, and, and law enforcement. And here, I think one of the other challenges is, remember where I started out about independence and sovereignty. Um, this, this won't work if it is seen as the US sort of lecturing Mexico or forcing different models on Mexico. Just as NAFTA had to come from the Mexican side, this effort will have to come from the Mexican side. And my guess is that it will work more effectively if it's not just US. So whether it involves Canada, whether it involves the experience that Colombia went through in some of these uh, same topics, whether there's European and other experience. So again, one of the themes that I was trying to stress here is we need to see North American integration, but always in the context of the global context and comparison. And I gave on the economic side some wonderful examples how Mexico had, had taken part of this and actually become a leader. And that's another aspect where we, I hope in education and other aspects, we can encourage the next generation of Mexican elected officials and appointed officials to assume those roles. Excellent, thank you. I think, you know, one of the topics that keeps coming up and it relates back also to the supply chain realignment is that right now there's a, a, lot, a lot of countries are pushing to try and become a greater part and take some of the manufacturing activity from China. But Mexico would really need to reform to be able to get a piece of that because there's a lot of countries out there competing for it and this issue of corruption is important. I see Rafael has his hand up. So I'm gonna to turn to Rafael. And then a question came in from Peter Gorovich, which I'll turn to Burkriti to read. So Rafael. Thank you, Caroline. It was just to remind everybody uh, listening to us that they should use the Q&A button to send their questions. We would like to do this as interactive as possible. And uh, so I'm glad that uh, our former dean, our first dean, Peter Guberich, is asking a question. Please go ahead, uh, Caroline. So the question, uh, subsidies for building factories can be hidden protectionism. What do you think of social service programs such as medical plans, unemployment insurance, worker safety, factory inspection, perhaps union rights, widely desired programs. And do you reject these as protectionism? Why or why not? No, in fact, let's start out with the basic part. I, if you're going to have an adaptive society and a society that adjusts to change, whether through economics or technology, you have to help people adjust to change. So uh, I have long supported the idea that whether it's healthcare or other types of income support, it would be best if it's linked to individuals as opposed to, uh, to the, say the company healthcare policies. My sense in the United States is one of the greatest anxieties caused for people losing a job was losing the healthcare because it was linked to the system. So I think whether it's saving systems, healthcare systems, other systems, uh, that has to be an important component of safety net and adjustment. We've actually learned a fair amount about sort of what works and what doesn't in this area. Um, and I take part with a group called the Aspen Economic Strategy Group that has actually had some wonderful papers commissioned on this. Place-based strategies are very hard. They're not impossible, but they're very, very hard. And they've got uh, many types of difficulties you have to overcome. Um, and I think uh, related back to the, uh, the notion of, of union organizing, I think there, and I, I alluded to this, um, I, I think that the labor provisions, if used in a way that will help Mexican labor unions become sort of free, non-corrupt participants in the process, could be extraordinarily healthy. However, this is where it will put a burden on responsibilities in the US and others. There will also always be a temptation to use these for protectionist purposes. And that's where public officials have to, to stand up and, and take some uh, action against them. 
So I think that uh, in general, I would follow the same principle uh, that Caroline did, which is if you're gonna provide subsidies, try to make them transparent. Um, frankly, uh, using pilots as a way to experiment and how to figure out how to retool them. Um, th those are also important part. And uh, in a world of constrained fiscal resources, I do think I would prefer to have them based on need. So I mentioned the Opportunatus program focusing on the bottom 15 to 20% that strikes me as better than a program that tries to give them to sort of all, all Mexicans. Um, so I think part of a support in societies for these transformations has to be based on such a program. And again, th this is where, frankly, schools like the University of California, San Diego can make an important contribution. There are, if you want, philosophical choices here. Do you want to encourage people to work or is it basically based more on a safety net? Uh, so this, the universal basic income is obviously one topic, very, very expensive. But let me give you a point, uh, sort of an example that I always thought had promise and should be tried more, which is the wage subsidy effort. So the wage subsidy program is based on the logic that if somebody's making $50,000 a year and loses his or her job, then they can get another job at 30,000, but they say, look, I'd rather wait to try to find something at 50,000. If you believe that having people in the workforce is good for their training, for their state of mind, or their sense of purpose, the wage subsidy idea was to say, well, let's take the difference between the 30 and the 50, some percentage, so maybe 50% of it, and, and over some period of time with some limits, subsidize the person to go back into the workforce as opposed to be on the side. Now, again, I can see where programs like these could have difficulties, but that strikes me as the type of idea you would want to have if your basic view was people are better in the workforce, in the workforce than out of the workforce. And then of course, there's a whole series of other workforce issues that people are debating about childcare and sort of a family leave programs. And I think all of those have to be part of a flexible dynamic system. Thanks very much. And I just want to highlight the importance of social policies for making trade sustainable or open trade sustainable over time. And I think that one thing we understand as trade economists better now is that we did not focus enough on the distributional consequences of trade uh, and in some sense, the failure of the social safety net in the US ended up resulting in this kind of blowback against trade. That said, technological change, demand shifts have contributed much more to job churn than trade has. I think there's lots of evidence showing that. So we have to be careful about tying, and you didn't say this, but I like the way you put it on wage subsidies and so forth. We wouldn't want to tr tie trade adjustment assistance. Uh, I actually don't like the idea of, of tying it to trade. I prefer assistance for anyone who loses jobs through no fault of their own rather than through trade alone, because then it makes it look as if trade is the cause. So more social safety net um, uh, for everyone, not just for the purpose of trade. But so, if you want so, to, I'd hear on that and then we'll have some questions from- Well, just, to, just a little thought, since this is a policy school, let me add the type of institutional issue that compounds that. Um, the terminology becomes very important and Caroline knows this, but maybe others may not. Trade adjustment assistance was actually something created in the US in the 70s by the Ways and Means and Finance Committees, which are the tax writing, but also the trade committees, because they wanted to create some political uh, support for the trade issues. But as Caroline mentioned, it was you were supposed to be related to losing a job to trade. And often, frankly, it took more time to trace the logic of whether somebody really lost the job to trade than other purposes. It was rather expensive. Now, there were many other worker adjustment programs, but they weren't run through TAA. They went by names like RAP and so on, worker readjustment programs. So there's, they were done by the Labor Department and the UK Education Department. And now this is a few years back, but I think 
somebody that ident- I think Glenn Hubbard had identified that there were maybe about 50 or 60 of such programs, most of which had never been tested. Um, and the budget figure for them was about 18 to $20 billion, much larger than the trade adjustment assistance. And so this is a, a good example of what we meant. So Caroline, you may find this amusing. I sometimes thought I, I had this dream of becoming the labor secretary so I could take that $20 billion and try to create a transfer program that was related to really kind of help people make the adjustment as opposed to pay all the different intermediary groups that were sort of involved, had their hand in the till. So, but to understand this, please note, the Ways and Means and Finance Committee will not want to defer all of that to the labor committees because they need to point to that when it comes time to making trade votes. Completely agree. I just think it's a little dangerous because then we start to think this is the reason people yeah, no, jobs. So I think politically it makes sense at the time, but there are some unintended consequences over the longer term. But I wish you had become labor secretary and put the money <laughs> in the right place without the intermediaries. That would have been fantastic. Um, Gurkriti, do you want to read a couple of the last questions? Maybe read them together, give, give Bob a chance to answer, and then we'll turn to Raphael for closing. Yeah, so we have time for maybe one more or two more questions. Um, one has come in from Lawrence Bros right here at the Center of Commerce and Diplomacy. Um, he notes that commercial linkages saved NAFTA, but are business stakeholders kind of doing enough to counteract those mercantilist pressures in North America and or globally? You want to give me the two questions? Maybe I can do them together or are they separate? Sure. Um, And then the next question is kind of on a separate topic. Can you describe the World Bank's more productive programs focused on Mexico? Okay, so on the first one, uh, the short answer is no. (laughs) Um, And uh, but part of this, we're also seeing this in the business community more generally now. Um, They saw the turn in politics against trade and frankly, in the Trump years, some uh, some sense that governmental power could be used to bash them if they didn't take a position. So they 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 hid under the table, um, and uh, uh, but but also I'd connect this. This is frankly where it comes back to the political leadership. So it's quite interesting um, if you look at say the Chicago Council on Global Affairs polling numbers about NAFTA or trade and others. They weren't. They actually were quite good. I mean, in support for trade is like 70, 80%, but it, it it's in COIC. And the question is kind of, will people, you know, support it uh, under particular political issues? And not surprisingly, kind of everyone understands the role of special interests that will have more intense set of feelings. I think one of the problems that NAFTA ran into was that, and I, you know, while I work closely with people in the Obama administration, respect many of them, they they quit defending it. There was actually an order that they weren't supposed to use the term NAFTA. Well, it's a little hard to win a debate if only one person or one side gets to make the argument. What was what was telling was again in many communities people didn't want to abandon this, and that's what sort of uh, that you could see when Trump actually tried to destroy it. You had this response back from from various communities. Um, so. Uh, I'm hoping that USMCA, including the improved labor provisions, creates an opportunity for people to come back on this, you know, and, and, you know, even the story that we've started to see with the Canadian railroads and Kansas City Southern and the Mexican, you can start to see the interconnections and linkages. If on top of that, one can connect this story to dealing with long-term immigration issues, maybe even Central American issues, uh, the importance of economic growth for environmental topics. I think you can build a broader base of support and that will be uh, important for the business community to do uh, over time. I, I traditionally found that a number of the border states in the South were supportive uh, of the trade with Mexico. Interestingly, Texas in particular because of, of different historical uh, and trade and economic ties. So I think there's there's a political base to be built on there. Um, another question that I've never had a good sense is, but for those that were part of Latino communities in the United States, you know, accusing Mexico of being rapists always struck me as something that they should object to as well as someone like me object to. And so, you know, can that be also part of sort of building our, our future society? 
So one last point on USMC and politics. Look, I've suggested, I wrote a piece, I think, in the Wall Street Journal that said, look, if the key is to have better treatment of some of the labor and environmental issues, now that we have USMCA, why don't we use it as a negotiation for great for UK after Brexit? In other, not just the US, but the three North American economies. It's a little hard to say that Britain's labor standards are not going to meet the test. But if you want to put in some labor standards for, for Britain, you know, fine, I'm sure those could be negotiated. But that would be a good example of taking the what I hope will be the success of USMCA and building on it. But you don't see people willing to do that. And so I, I that's, again, a, a prod that I would put forward. The second question was about with Mexico and, and could yes. you repeat it? Yes, the World Bank's more productive programs focused on Mexico, if you know of any yeah. or if you have any ideas on them. Yeah, well, I'm a little dated on this, but I will, I'll will emphasize when I came to the World Bank in 2007, you know, and uh, frankly, the, 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 the finance ministry, it was this first rate. Um, and uh, Augustine Karstens actually, I think, was the, the, the governor that, that was sort of coordinating the overall bank presidents. There was almost a mood in Mexico that they wanted to graduate from the World Bank. And what I was able to explain was, given the uncertainties, some long-term sort of low-cost uh, financing would be important with projects on, on various particular areas. And you may re recall this time you had, we, we had some hurricanes and natural disasters. And we were able to share a lot of the experience of natural disasters and, and have more of a resilient strategy. Um, and the idea here was not to see the loans primarily as money-based, but to see them as knowledge-based about different experience. One that I was able to make some headway in Brazil, but not with Mexico, and I still think it has some, some potential, is this point I referred to about capacity at the state level. I think you could have programs and loans that could actually focus on developing state governance capacity and project development at the state level and improve the governance uh, at, at lower levels of uh, the Mexican system. Um, and then, frankly, uh, we, we found uh, with when there were other types of uh, crisis uh, the, with the, the financial crisis, the backstop that we could provide to Mexico was also a, a, a point of reinsurance policy. Now, this also brings you to the larger questions about the role of the Federal Reserve and SWAP programs and others, which I think are probably uh, as important, if, if not more important. Um, but so part of this is the experience that can, just as Mexico shared with others, that you can draw from other developing countries with Mexico. And there's certainly a lot to learn there, including on the one that we focused on which is courts and legal systems. Excellent, thank you so much. I think this has been a great discussion. Unfortunately, we're at time. So let me turn to Rafael for some closing remarks. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, we truly appreciate uh, you sharing with us your thoughts. Uh, uh, you're always candid in, in expressing your thoughts and, uh, and this, that's what we need in universities. We need this dialogue, uh, otherwise we can advance. And, and both them, uh, as a Mexican, let me thank you because since the early NAFTA, since the NAFTA negotiation, negotiation, you've been a, a true champion of North America. You were the, the, the go-to guy when Mexico had problems. It was uh, Bob Selleck that uh, President Salinas and his team were looking for. <clears throat> President Calderon, what he needed <clears throat> help uh, at the COP16 in Cancun, 2010. It was Bob Selleck at the helm of the World Bank who helped us a lot. So thank you, and uh, and thank you to continue to, to pursue this, this North American idea. It will be in, in, in the benefit of Americans, Mexicans, and Canadians. Thank you, Bob, and thank you all. Uh, we'll resume, I believe, at uh, in one hour, and uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you, Guriki, uh, for, for, for filling the questions to both. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.